radio audience to the worship of the Main Street Church of Christ. We'd encourage you to go to our website at www.churchofchristpreaching.com or www.mainstreetchurchofchrist.com. Either one will bring you to our website. We have a thousand lessons on there, audio lessons, uh, video lessons. We have written lessons, all kinds of lessons, all kinds of singing, all kinds of commentaries. We uh, studied how that God had a plan from before the foundation of the world to save mankind in Jesus Christ, his son. That that foundation was before God ever created the universe. God had a plan. And we're going to study that again today. We studied the seed lesson that through all of this Old Testament period, there were over 300 different prophecies that God gave us prophesying the coming of Christ, exactly what he would be like, exactly when he would come, exactly what he would do, that he would live, die, be buried, and rise from the dead the third day. All of those things are prophesied in the Old Testament. And we have copies of the Old Testament that were written before Jesus was ever born. It is impossible that somebody could invent this book called the Bible because it just proves itself with the prophecies and, and the fulfillment of prophecies. Now, since Christ, since his death, burial, and resurrection, God saves people into the kingdom of God and in the church of Christ. You're translated from the kingdom of this world, the kingdom of Satan, to the kingdom of his dear son. When you come to God in, in, in the appointed way. We've been studying a lesson called In Christ. And how all the promises of the New Testament is around these two little words. In Christ or in Him or in whom is, is the term that's used in, in the Bible. And so we've studied this the last couple of weeks. And we're going to pick up and go back over a couple of high points to get your mind back in what we've been studying. So turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. We'll begin there, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. But thanks be to God, which always causes us to triumph and make manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Look at that first clause. Now thanks be to God, which always causes us to triumph. Triumph in the Greek is thriambu bau. I'm not a Greek, so it's not easy. Um, it means a noisy victory parade. Those of you that have seen the great Cecil B. DeMille's movies, Ben-Hur as an example, and Exodus, see that kind of spectacle which is a great noisy parade. They'd be led by a thousand trumpeters. And then along would come the king in his chariot and uh, with the slaves behind him, following along behind him, the army behind him and the slaves. And so this metaphor is applied to, uh, to uh, us as Christians. Such a triumph in the uh, Roman world was always uh, featured uh, the conquering uh, of many captives which were led behind the king. Some to be freed at the spectacle and some for the sacrifices of the spectacle to be the featured sacrifice. And so just as the, the, this victory parade took place in the Greek world, uh, 
Christ is leading both sheep and goats. And he's going to separate the sheep from the goats one of these days. And I want you to be among the sheep. Turn with me now to 2 Corinthians 5.17. We talked about it a little last week. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, you need to get into Christ. How do you get into Christ? Well, you hear the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You believe the gospel. You put your faith and trust and confidence in God to save you. You repent of your sins, confess Christ as Lord. You're baptized into Christ. And that puts you into Christ, not unto Christ, but into Christ. And so if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. So God has made us new creatures in Christ. It's a growing process. We're not perfect, but we're becoming better. And look down to uh, uh, verse uh, 21. For he made him... For he, God, made him Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Notice that it's a making process. It's a becoming process. We're becoming like the righteousness of God if we're in him. We're becoming more and more and more Christ-like. Okay, so drop down with me now to Ephesians 1 3. Blessed be the God. Blessed means to utilize or pray, to do a eulogy or to praise someone. So praise be to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath, notice it's already happened, who hath, past tense verb, who hath blessed us, who is the us, the church, both Jews and Gentiles, black and white, all of us, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Uh, Jesus and God held back none. They gave them all to us. Where are these spiritual blessings? In heavenly, heavenly, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven is the same thing. It's a term that's used interchangeably in the Bible. If you read Matthew's account of, as an example, the parable of the sower, he says the kingdom of heaven is likened to a sower that went forth to sow, Matthew 13, 1. If you read Luke's account of that same parable in Luke chapter 8, you'll see that he uses kingdom of God. Mark uses kingdom of God. So Mark and Luke call it the kingdom of God. Matthew calls it the kingdom of heaven. These are interchangeable terms that means the same thing. Just like you calling me Kelly or you calling me Lawson. Both of them the same thing. Interchangeable terms. And so that's what we have here is an interchangeable term. Uh, speaking of the church, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath, hath blessed us, the church, with all spiritual blessings in the church or in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Verse 4, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Chosen does not mean that he has chosen us and rejected others, but rather that God chose a foreordained plan to have a people for himself, which is called the people of Christ or the church of Christ. In Titus 1-2, Titus begins by telling us in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. God promised this great salvation that we have in Christ Jesus way back here before he ever created anything. He promised salvation in Christ before the world began. Verse 5, Ephesians 1, 5. Having predestinated us. Who's the us? It's not me. Having predestinated the church unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ unto his self according to the good pleasure of his will. Predestinated is from the Greek pro in front or before and ordezo to limit the advance, to mark out the bounds, to set how far it'll go. 
defined beforehand or foredetermined. God, before the foundation of the world, determined that both Jews and Gentiles, black and white, red and green, every color of all people is going to be saved one place, and that's in Christ Jesus in his church. God is sovereign. He has made up a sovereign plan, and it's to the pleasure of his will. It's what he decided would save the most people the most efficient way. Ephesians 1.10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one, into one church, all things in Christ. So God wants everybody to come together and be one not divided, that he might gather together all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth, even in him. And so this dispensation of the fullness of times is this dispensation that when Christ came into the world at the very right time, he, God sent Christ into the world at the very best time. Roman roads connected the entire earth. All the border posts were down. All the borders were open. They were free travel. All the world knew the Greek language as a second language. And so it was the very right time in history God sent forth his son. Ephesians 1.11 In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated, the church is, according to the purpose of him, who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. And of course that inheritance is a wonderful thing. In 1 Corinthians 2, 9 it says, But as is written, eyes not seen, nor ear heard, neither is entered into the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for those that love him. God has wonderful preparation already made for those that love him. This preparation is the entire universe. Whatever is out there, God has already prepared it, and he's prepared it for those that love him, and I hope that you'll be a part of it too. Ephesians 1.15 Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints, 16, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. If you're in among the saints, that's where this inheritance is. What inheritance? Well, the one that eyes not seen, ears not heard, neither's entered into the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for those that love him. There's a wonderful universe out there waiting for us. We're going to new heavens and a new earth wherein righteousness dwells. We have a destination, a brand new world in Christ Jesus. Verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power, kraktos, meaning vigor, strength, and dominion? What is the exceeding greatness of his vigor, strength, and dominion towards us who believe according to the workings of his mighty power? What kind of power is that? Well, he tells us in the next verse, verse 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. If the blood of Jesus Christ is powerful enough to save us from our sins, how much more powerful, that's a dead Savior, how much more powerful is a living Savior that's now seated at God's own right hand? That every time I goof, every time I stumble, every time I sin, every time I do something I shouldn't, Jesus is standing for me as a great high priest making intercession for me before God. One of the prophecies concerning that is Psalms 110 verse 1, written by David a thousand years before Christ is ever born. 
In Psalms 110, verse 1, And the Lord said to my Lord, Set thou at my right hand, till I make thy enemies thy footstool for thy feet. King David wrote a psalm and told us the Lord, Yahweh, God, the Lord God, said unto my Lord, my Adonai, sit thou at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool for thy feet. In that psalm is used both words that the Old Testament used to refer to God. He is both Yahweh, Yahweh, and he is Adonai, the Lord, which is a title. One is a name, the other is a title. Both are used in the Old Testament. Both are David's Lord. And so God, a thousand years before Christ is ever born, looks forward in the future to the resurrection of Christ and tells Christ through this prophecy that he is someday going to sit at the right hand of God. Verse uh, uh, 4 also says that the Lord has sworn thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So Jesus is doing the work of a high priest, interceding for me, interceding for you. When we goof, if we're Christians, if we can continue walking in the light as he is in the light, we continue confessing our sins one to another, confessing to God when we goof. If we continue trying, he's going to be continuing saving. Verse 21. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world but also that which is to come. Far above all kings, princes, magistrates, judges, angelistic beings, both good and bad, far above Donald Trump, far above the government, far above anything that's got you concerned, far above Hillary Clinton, far above the army, Far above anything. Jesus is above all of it. And he's able to save each and every one of us from our sins and whatever predicament we're in. Verse 22. And has put all things under his feet, above, uh, under Jesus' feet. And gave him to be the head over all things to the church. Christ has given all authority and all power. He's made the head over the church, not just the ruler, but the head of the body. The life comes from the head. You can't do without the head. We as Christians are referred to through different metaphors in the New Testament as being a hand or being a foot or being an eye. And a body can live without a hand and without a foot, without an eye, but it can't live without a head. So this body, this church of Christ, has a living head who is seated at God's own right hand, looking out for his hands, looking out for his feet, looking out for his body, which is you. And he cares about you. 23, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Let's go down to uh, the, these last four verses describes Christ's glorious resurrection, his exaltation to God's own right hand, his supreme dominion over all things. He's in charge of everything and his being the head of the church, which is his body. Ephesians 2, 6. And hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Before you can be raised, you too must die to sin and be buried into death, the death of Christ, and risen with him. Just like Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 3, tells us. Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ? We're baptized into his death. Therefore, being buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. So if you have been raised with him, you're now seated with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. 
It's just like, you remember when we were little kids, you'd go run and jump in your mama's lap? It wasn't a safer place to be, was there? Well, I'm telling you, we're in the lap of Christ right now. If you'll have it that way, that's the way he wants you to be. In Colossians 2, verse 12, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation. See that word operation? Through the operation of God who has raised him from the dead. Let's talk about that word operation. That word operation is energos. It's the same Greek word that is translated everywhere else in the New Testament work. Now we hear many people telling us that you can't work for your salvation and they belittle baptism. They say, oh, you don't need to be baptized. You just should be baptized. Baptism is a work and you can never be saved by works. Baptism is a work. Guess who works in baptism? Who does that verse say works? Let's read that verse again. Buried with him in, Kelly was buried with him in baptism, wherein also Kelly was risen with him through the faith of the work of Kelly. It just doesn't say that at all. It says the exactly opposite of that, doesn't it? What does it say? Buried with him in baptism, when, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the work or the operation of God. Who does the work in baptism? God does the work. I could get in this baptistry here and get lava soap and the biggest scrub brush in the world and I can't cleanse one sin off of me. You can put bleach in the water and it wouldn't get one sin off of me. A whole bottle of Tide couldn't do it. (laughs) Nothing can get rid of my sins. I could scrub up in there bubbles that'd be coming out everywhere. I could scrub up in there and it wouldn't do one thing. wouldn't get rid of one sin. You can't work and earn your salvation. Who washes away thy sins? Well, it's like Psalms 51. Wash me, and I shall be white. Cleanse me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Your soul can be cleansed, but only God can cleanse it. Colossians 3.1, if you're now a Christian, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, wherein Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. So we need to set our mind on heavenly things. We need to be thinking about good things instead of bad things. And we need to become like Christ and realize again that he is seated at the right hand of God making intercession for us. Colossians 3, 2. Set your affections on the things above and not on the things on earth. So we need to start thinking of heavenly things and where we're going. Life is short. Ephesians 2.10 For we are his workmanship created created anew in Christ. You see where we're created? We're created in Christ. You got to be in Christ to be created anew. You can't be created anew outside of Christ. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them or live in them, that that should be a way of life for us. It is God who has saved us and made us new creatures through the gospel. We are therefore his workmanship. He's done all the work to make us new creatures. God has always ordained that all who believe the gospel and are saved should practice good works and do good deeds. What are good deeds? Well, we feed the poor. We take care of the poor. We try to do things for the poor. We try to preach the gospel of the entire earth. There probably aren't any two better good deeds that you could do. And that's why we chose those good deeds. Because those are the very things that God would, we believe that God would have us do to uh, uh, make him happy 
to convert more people, to make people's life here better. I'm telling you, we fed thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people in the last 23 years. Oh, it's the stories that I could tell you. Sean. How many of y'all remember Sean? Remember Sean? Sean was on the street. The first day I saw her was at Fred Bond's junkyard down here. And right across the street was a great big tall black girl, skinny black girl, and her old man. And uh, they were arguing, and in a minute, he knocked her down. And she gets up, and she starts boxing him. And she's on her toes, man. I mean, she's jabbing. She's blocking. She's counterpunching. And she knows what she's doing. She's been on the street since she was eight years old. This girl has heard every lie, been raped by every, every John, every punk in East, East Dallas. She's been on the street for 25 years, 30 years. <coughs> we loved her. We fed her. In a couple of years, she's a Christian. In a couple of years more, she's, she's not drinking. And she's no longer doing drugs. She's no longer hooking out there, no longer doing any of that stuff. She's become a Christian. She comes down with cirrhosis of the liver, and the doctors don't want to tell her she's a dead duck, and they ask me to do it. They want me to do their dirty work. Now, I was glad to do it. And so I went in and told her, Sean, the doctors just told me that you're that you're not going to make it, you're going to die. And she cried, and I cried, and we cried, and we prayed. And I said, but you know, there's, you've got the great assurance. You're just going to beat me there. That's all there is to it. I'm right behind you, and I'm not very far. She was over here in this rehab hospital on, uh, off of Ross, and we saw her all the time until she passed. What a great testimony Sean is to the power of the gospel of Christ that was just captured by good deeds, by good works, by somebody loving her, by somebody caring about her. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them or live in them. Ephesians 2, 11. Wherefore, remember that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh who were called the uncircumcision, of which that is called the circumcision, and made of flesh of hands, verse 12, that at that time you were out Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenant of promise, and having no hope, and without God in the world. Paul says, remember that in times past, before you heard the preaching of Christ, that you were strangers from this covenant of promise. This whole line here is a covenant of promise that God made way back here to Adam and Eve in the garden when he said, I will put enmity between thee and the serpent, between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy heel, and thou shalt bruise his head. Then all the way through this covenant, through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all the covenants that God made from Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, King David, all of those covenants, the covenant of the law, we were Gentiles. We didn't know anything about any of that. And in times past, we were just lost going through the world, lost. Those people were just going through the world, lost. And you heard about Christ. They heard about Christ. And they came to Christ and became Christians. They knew nothing about the commonwealth of Israel, the state of Israel, or the covenant of promise, the covenant of the law. They knew nothing about any of that. Verse 13. But now in Christ, notice you've got to be in Christ, but now in Christ, ye who were sometimes afar off, are made near nigh by the blood of Christ. Once so far off, separated from God, we've been brought near, and the way that we've been brought near is the blood of Christ. Verse 14, For he is our peace, who has made both one, and has broken down the middle wall of partition. In the temple in Jerusalem, Outside of the temple itself, in the courtyard, which was outside, there was in the temple space itself, was the, the uh, 
the altar, the laver, and the temple. Outside of that, in the courtyard where people worshipped, was a courtyard for the Jews and a courtyard for the Gentiles. And it was just like, well, we're Gentiles, blacks sit at the back of the bus. Anybody remember that? Well, that's the way it was. That's the way it was. It was a courtyard that separated the Jews from the Gentiles. They were segregated, and they couldn't come together. But now in Christ Jesus, God is saving us all together. Race has nothing to do with salvation. God is saving us all together in Christ. So let's look at verse 14 again. He is our peace. He's our peace with God who has made both one, Jew and Gentile, black and white, every color, and has broken down this petition, this middle wall of petition. We as Gentiles no longer have to sit at the back of the bus. We can boldly approach God through Christ Jesus and come directly to the throne of God with our prayers. God has a wonderful thing for us. Nineteen. Therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and with the household of God. Isn't that wonderful? Verse 20. And are built upon the foundation of the church, us, the beings that are in Christ, were built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the building fits together, framed together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In the ancient world, God was worshipped in buildings and temples. And God had sacrifices. You had to bring a sheep and cut the sheep's throat. And the soul that sent us shall surely die. And so you sin, so you got to bring a sheep, cut his throat, Give it to the priest. The priest sprinkles the blood. That pushes the sin forward one year. You don't get forgiveness under this Old Testament covenant. There was no such thing. It always pushed the sins forward to the next day of atonement until the cross, until Christ comes. in whom the building, the church, fits, frames together, grows into a holy temple unto the Lord. So we are the temple of God. We are this new temple, just like God was supposed in the ancient world uh, dwell in temples. God now wants to dwell in living temples. He wants to dwell in the hearts of people. Verse 22, in whom also you're builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Just exactly like this old temple, behind the veil was the Ark of the Covenant. And the priest would go in there once a year on the Day of Atonement, and they'd tie a rope around his waist, and they'd let that rope out, and he'd go in there, and he would be taking blood on hyssop and incense and going in there and he'd sprinkle that blood that's on a hyssop branch, he'd sprinkle that on the mercy seat confessing his own sins and the sins of the people. The Shekinah righteousness of God dwelt above the, uh, the mercy seat and above the Ark of the Covenant in a temple. God now, instead of dwelling in a temple like back here, like back here, no, he doesn't dwell there. Where does he dwell now? He dwells in the hearts of us by the Holy Spirit. The Shekinah righteousness of God, the same thing, comes and dwells in the spirits of people. God does not want dead sacrifices anymore, no more cutting a lamb's throat. He wants living sacrifices. And what are those living sacrifices? 
Well, Romans 12, 1 tells us, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. That word service is a word that is what a priest does, is a work of service. So since you're a priest, God now dwells in you. What type of sacrifice does he want? He wants you to present your bodies as living sacrifices to God. He wants you to abstain from sin the very best that you can in your body where you don't sin. Don't sin. Do your very best not to sin. If you sin, confess it quick. Ephesians 3, 6. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. So all of God's promise, the wall of partition is broken down, and all of God's promise, all her fellow members, both Jews and Gentiles, black and white, were all fellow members in this one body, the Church of Christ. 3.14, that the blessings of Abraham, Galatians 3.14, that the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through Jesus Christ that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So the Spirit now lives in our hearts. We have received this promise. Now we're back to Ephesians 3.10. To intent now and to the principalities and powers and heavenly places might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. The manifold wisdom of God, that word manifold, means over and over and over again wisdom of God. Throughout all of the Old Testament, you see the manifold wisdom of God, the over and over and over and over again wisdom of God. And all through the New Testament, you see the same thing. So the church is supposed to make known to the entire world, both good and bad, the manifold wisdom of God and we'll talk all about that, what it means. To the intent, the mystery was hidden throughout the ages, but is now revealed in order that the manifold, over and over, wisdom of God be made known through preaching the gospel to the Jews, to Gentiles, to angelistic beings, both good and bad, to every creature uh, we are to reach out. Verse 11. According to his eternal purpose, the eternal purpose. God's only had one eternal purpose. Notice it's the eternal purpose. According to the eternal purpose, which he proposed where? In Christ Jesus our Lord. God's eternal purpose, this one purpose, is in Christ. It's not anywhere else. We'd like to encourage our radio audience to go to our website at www.churchofchristpreaching.com and you'll find a thousand sermons on there, a thousand written lessons, all kinds of things. I got a call this morning from a guy in Tennessee who started a house church and uh, it's really encouraging to talk to people. He had some Bible questions. We're going to send him some information. And so we get those all the time. That's just a normal occurrence with us. And how wonderful it is that the gospel goes from this little bitty place. Who'd ever think somebody in Tennessee would hear us? Well, they're hearing us all over the world, brethren, thanks to you. Ephesians 3.12 In whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Both Jews and Gentiles can come boldly to God. Notice the definite article before faith. The faith of him. The faith is all of New Testament Christianity. It's not just you having faith, but you coming to God properly according to this book, not according to some doctrine and tradition of men. Some, some Joe Blow tells you, well, all you got to do is just say the sinner's prayer. Has anybody ever seen the sinner's prayer in this book? 
If anybody will bring me the sinner's prayer, I'll eat this book right in front of you. If you just show it to me in there, where it tells you to do that. But men think that they can improve on God's plan. They say, oh, it's hard to get them to believe and to have faith and to repent and to confess and to be baptized into Christ. That's too hard. Let's just get them to say the sinner's prayer. Well, does it work? I don't know. I don't know. I'd like to be utterly liberal and say, man, I hope so. But I don't know whether it works or not. I don't know whether it works or not. Will God operate different in His Word? No. I mean, surely He won't. He says that His Word will not return void, that heaven and earth will pass away and not one jot and one tittle will in any wise be moved. He says that this is inspired, God breathed. It's <coughs> this is dangerous ground, brethren, that we're, uh, that we're walking on. The faith, the faith of Christ. The book of Philippians, this term is also used a lot also. We'll begin Philippians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul and Timothy, the servants, of Jesus Christ to all the saints notice where the saints are in Christ Jesus this is terms that are just interchangeable again it means the same thing if you're a saint you're in Christ and if you're in Christ you're a saint what is this what does this word saint mean it means the holy one it's an Old Testament term too. They referred to it as the Zacidium, the Hasidium, the Holy Ones, those who were pious and holy in the Old Testament that abstained from, from unrighteousness. They were called saints. Saints are not all some bunch of dead people. There's a lot of dead saints, that's true. But there's a lot of living saints too. Every Christian that's in Christ Jesus is a saint. To all the saints in Christ which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. Verse 13. So that my bonds, Paul was in a chain when he wrote to you. He was in a slammer and he had a chain on both hands on both wrists, and a Roman soldier was guarding him all the time. And his neck was at stake, man. He was going to either live or die when he went and saw Caesar. And this is written during that period of time, at two years while Paul was at Rome, waiting for his hearing before Nero Caesar. So that my bonds in Christ are manifest, being seen, in all the palace. See that word? Palace? It's not place, it's palace. Actually, the word in Greek is patorium, used to refer to a body of men that were the patorian guard, the bodyguard, the secret service, that took care of the president then was called the Praetorian Guard. And this guard was the household guard of Caesar. And the household guard of Caesar is exactly who was guarding Paul. He was an imperial prisoner, therefore he was guarded by the imperial guard. Now, Paul was such a high-class imperial prisoner that instead of being in the slammer in the jail, he got to rent his own house, and the soldier would just come to his house, and they would do a shift and send another soldier. And they'd do a shift and send another soldier. And Paul got to preach all that time, and those people in the Praetorium Guard had to listen to his preaching. He had a captive audience. 
He was supposed to be the prisoner, but actually the guards had to hear the gospel too. Verse 13, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. So again, this is the Praetorian, uh, referring to the Praetorium Guard. Prove that. Well, let's look at Philippians. Let's jump to the end of Philippians. Philippians 4, verse 21-22. Salute every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren which are with me greet you. All the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. How amazing. There are saints among Caesar's household. Most learned old time historians were of the opinion that Paul converted not only Caesar's wife, but his mother. Nero heard the gospel. When he heard the gospel, he said he went ballistics and had Paul put in a dungeon then, and then said, bring him back to me later. And then later, Paul was executed for his belief in Christ. But Nero Caesar also killed his mother. He killed his pregnant wife and the baby and uh, went crazy when he heard the gospel of Christ. He had the choice. He could have believed and obeyed just like you and I. Could have been a Christian. He could have been saved forever. But he didn't want to give up the title son of God. He, see, he thought he was the son of Zeus. Well, I bet he knows better than that now. Philippians 1.13, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. How wonderful it is that Paul was such of a great influence to, uh, to teach so many people in the uh, Caesar's own Praetorium Guard. Verse 14, and many of the brethren in the Lord. Notice where brethren are. They're in Christ or in the Lord. This is a term that simply means Christian. And you read the New Testament and people don't have any idea what it's saying. All of these blessings are not for you unless you're in the Lord. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Paul was such a noble character that the two years that he spent preaching the gospel day and night, others in the church in Rome began to do the same thing. Uh, Philippians 1, verse 26, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ, for by me and for my coming unto you again. Chapter 2, verse 1 of Philippians. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if they be any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, for any bowels of mercies. Collectively, uh, the four premises of this verse add up to this. Look, if there is anything at all to your Christianity, if you're really a Christian, if there's anything at all to your Christianity, Lightfoot paraphrased this as... Uh, if your experiences in Christ appeal to you with any force, if love exerts any persuasive power upon you, if your fellowship in the Spirit is a living reality, if you have any affectionate yearnings of the heart, enter any tender feelings of in compassion, listen and obey them. That foot was a genius, wasn't it? Thus it's clear that Paul here appeals for unity upon all the sacred elements of true Christianity, upon our highest and best impulses as human beings. Always try to go the extra mile to do something good. We close here at noon every day. We feed from nine to noon, we close at noon, and Joe and I is often in the office for another hour or two after that, and, 
and constantly there's knocking on the door that there's somebody wants a sandwich. Well, that's what we do. That's what we do. How wonderful it is. And so if you've got any mercy in your heart, you get up and go get a sandwich for somebody. And that's what we try to do. But we want you to think just like God thinks. This is appeal for unity among all Christians. This is the true elements of Christianity, doing good to one another and preaching the gospel to the whole wide world. So we want to try to get you to think like Christ thought. Philippians 2, 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. In this verse, Paul presents Christ as a supreme example of unselfishness to which he has exhorted the Philippians to, uh, to strive for. Having the mind of Christ in one is equivalent to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit as well as the indwelling of the Father and the Son in the hearts of all Christians. And so we want to ask you to begin to think like God. How does one think like God? Well, God cares for everybody, and he'd like you to care for everybody. God cares for the poor. He'd like for you to care for the poor. He says, blessed is he who remembereth the poor. The Lord will be with him in a time of trouble. Psalms 41. So I'm going to try to remember the poor. I need God to be with me in a time of trouble. And sure enough, what happened? Well, in 2009, I had a massive heart attack. I died three times. God was with me in a time of trouble. That Psalms goes on to say that God will preserve your life, raise you up from your bed of languishing, give you more life. Well, so far, he's given me seven years of more life. Should have been dead seven years ago. So let the mind of Christ dwell in you. Try to do good. Love one another. Do your very best to be Christians. The gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, that which I preached unto you, and that which you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you're saved, if, if you keep in memory that which I've delivered unto you. What if you don't? What if you forget this? Well, it tells you, unless you've believed in vain. So if you forget this, your belief is in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture that he was buried, and that he arose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now that's the gospel, and God wants you to obey the gospel. And how do you obey the gospel? God wants you to put your faith and trust and confidence in God to save you. Because without faith, it's impossible to please him, the Hebrew writer tells us. We need to confess Christ before men. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before the Father. Well, I really like that idea. And then you need to be baptized into Christ. To rise to walk in newness of life. What does God want us to do? He wants us to die to sin, be buried in a watery grave of baptism, and rise to walk in newness of life. If you're here this morning, you have sin in your life, you need to help the church and the prayers of the church. You are ready to become a Christian. Just march right down at the front. Meet us down at the front. Won't you come now while we stand and sing?